Thank you very much. And I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here to this workshop. It's great to be here. It's a very diverse audience. And I'm very happy to be able to present some of my work here. The work I will be talking about will be loosely based on two papers which I wrote together with Jim Harbison and one was with Brent Nelson from Northeastern in Boston and one is uh, also with this group in preparation. So I understand it's a very diverse audience, physics, mathematics, and artificial intelligence. So let me start by saying a few words about uh, particle physics and cosmology as we understand it today. Experiments tell us that our cosmos, the energy budget of our cosmos is uh, distributed like that. And essentially what we really understand out of these 100 percent are these 4.9 percent. Um, here we know that um, these are made up of particles, which we found, for example, at CERN and other experiments before. So fundamental particles are split into uh, fermions half integer spin particles, and these are the matter, the matter states of the universe. Then we have bosons or spin one particles. These carry forces in the universe, and then we have the Higgs boson, which was only found very recently, and then this gives mass to the particles, to the, to the fermions, and also to these bosons after symmetry breaking. And they are spread out on a very large scale here. So, I'll try to get out. <laughs> Down here, you have um, the, scale, the energy scale in electron volts. So, electron volt is the energy which an electron has after it passes one volt, or it's accelerated by one volt. And you see this is rather spread out. So the elementary particles are somewhere between ele one electron volt range for the lighton, for the neutrinos, then we have the electrons, the quarks, and then and up here at the very top, we have the heaviest quark, the top quark, and the Higgs. So um, we have this 10 orders or so of magnitude, or 12 orders of magnitude, spanned by elementary particles that make up this, and their binding energy make up this 5% this of the energy budget. Let's shrink this down a little bit and look at uh, higher energies. So this is where we were now. Now we have another 18 order of magnitude. And up here, we have now physics at a very, very high energy scale. So this is the Planck scale. This is a scale where essentially gravity <coughs> becomes as important as the other gauge symmetries or the other gauge bosons which we have here. I'm a string theorist, so I'm interested in this regime, in a regime of quantum gravity, where gravity and the other forces are roughly of the same, of the same strength. So we have this huge, huge gap in between, and when I talk about high energy physics, I, I really talk about this regime. So this is the outline of my talk. I will start with an introduction to string theory and string compactification. Then I'm going to talk about complex computation complexity and decidability in string theory. I give a brief recap of that, and then I'll explain what type of problems we are facing. And, and this is also one of the reasons why we, or why I actually started using machine learning in string theory. And after that, I will use a field of machine learning that is called reinforcement learning in order to <coughs> find solutions to a string series consistency conditions. And um, yeah, we will see that, that this type of machine learning approach was very successful for the, for the question you were asking. And in the end, I will conclude. Let me start now with the uh, introduction to string theory and string compactifications. So I will try to avoid jargon as much as possible, but if you have any question, please do interrupt me and do ask. <coughs> so, as it turns out, we can describe all physics we observe using just four fundamental forces in our universe. Three of them are described by quantum field theory, and these are precisely the strong force mediated by the gluons, and the, electro or the electric force mediated by the photon, and the weak force, which is, for example, uh, responsible for uh, atomic decays, and this is described by W and Z bosons. And then above the Higgs mass, so if these two unify into what's called the electroweak 
uh, symmetry, and the SU3 stays around for the ride. So these are three of the, uh, three of the four forces. The fourth force is, of course, a Einstein's relati uh, general relativity theory. So here I have drawn, or oh, I have taken a picture, I have drawn this myself, a picture of a black hole merges, two black holes spiral, they create gravity waves and they, they, then they collide. Okay, this was not intentional, but it was a good effect. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, if you want to ask questions about, um, about very high scale energies where these effects are, are of a similar strength, so what happens in, at, at a black hole, or what happened when the universe began at the Big Bang, right, right at these very high energies, we need to have a theory of quantum gravity. So, for this, uh, from this point of view, it's sort of um, not very convenient that we have these two different formulations, which in and by themselves were very well and have been uh, con confirmed by experiments of very high precision, but their formulations are completely different. So what you want is a unified framework so that you can answer questions about uh, black holes or the beginning of the universe in a unified framework. So, okay, so you say, okay, I have this table, where's the problem, I just put a new particle here. I call it a graviton. We know it has to have spin 2, it has to be uncharged, so I just put it here. Problem is, if you do this in a naive way, you just get a bunch of PS. So you need to do it in a clever way instead. And string theory is probably the most promising candidate to do this. To include a force carrying particle, the graviton, like you have the other gauge bosons, into the theory such that it is well defined. However, if, as I said, you cannot just do it in a naive way, you do it in a complicated way and you pay the price. Um, the price is extremely strong mathematical consistency conditions that get imposed in your theory. So you do something which sounds very innocent, you take your particles and you say, okay, I assume they are not point particles, but they are stretched out strings and these are time strings, they start to vibrate. The pattern in which they vibrate tell you whether you get an electron or a proton or a quark or whatever. But um, you, need to, um, you need to do this in a very, very careful way. So one thing, one of the uh, consistency conditions that are imposed are you need uh, 10 space time dimensions rather than just four. This sounds very exotic. In fact, the Kaluza Klein theory is also Theories with extra space time dimensions have been studied long before string theory, and people knew that good things happen or interesting things happen when you go to higher dimensional theories. So, of course, we still need to explain why we only see four dimensions and not ten. And usually, the way this is explained is you assume we have the four dimensional theory, which I just drew as the two dimensional grid, and then at each point, you have an extra six dimensional space on top of that. And these extra six dimensions are small and compact, so that we cannot see it, but the string sees it. So the string lives in ten dimensions exactly, we live in four dimensions and don't see extra six, we are also happy. And this is sort of how you make contact with the real world if you have a string theory. So now you cannot just put any space here. So you could think I just take whatever space I like and put it at each point in, in my space time. However, as it turns out, one of the stringent string consistency conditions that, um, that are imposed on you means that the space has uh, very, very special properties. So it needs to be what's today known as a kalabi yau manifold. Kalabi was a mathematician who conjectured existence of a metric that's relevant for string theory that solves the equations of motions of string theory, and Yao proved that this actually does exist. So this is why these spaces are called kalabi yau manifolds. In addition, you get new degrees of freedom from, in, from introducing these six extra dimensions. So first of all, you can put um, what's called a gauge flux into or onto the six-dimensional field. So you, typically, when you have um, the force carriers, these are gauge theories. And if you gave them a bet in the four-dimensional theory, you would break Lorentz invariance, and experiments tell us that Lorentz invariances are broken to a high degree of precision, so you shouldn't do that. In the six extra dimensions, you can do this because Lorentz symmetry is broken anyways there. So you, you get these extra degrees of freedom which you cannot do in four dimensions. And moreover, you can have 
submanifolds. Inside the six-dimensional manifold, you can have four-dimensional manifolds or two-dimensional manifolds. And on these manifolds, you can put higher-dimensional objects, like planes or brains, that wrap around, the, let's say, a torus or a sphere. And you can have an open string that ends on these, on these brains. So in general, as I said, you take a point part particle, you replace it by you replace it by a string, and the string can be open or it can be closed. If it's open, it's stretched between two end its endpoints are fixed to brains, and these brains are then attached or wrapping wrapped around some two or four-dimensional submanifolds in this six-dimensional Calvio space. All this data, which we now have in addition to the compactification space, the fluxes, and the brains, they can all be described by topological invariants. What I mean by this is um, they are um, quantities, or these are data that does not rely on the metric. Um, and they are just specified by a bunch of integers. So if you want to classify, or if you want to specify the string theory you're studying here, you can do this in terms of a bunch of integers. That sounds very good and very simple, so let's just write down a bunch of integers and study string theory. Um, well, of course, it's not that easy. There are two problems, essentially. The first problem is non-uniqueness. So, essentially, all physics that you get out of string theory depends on this data, which we, which we have, these, uh, the choice of the compactification manifold, the fluxes, the brains, and so on. And we do not have a selection mechanism for this data. So we can choose different things. It's very stringent. As I said, they are constrained by mathematics. But we do not know what to choose in, in the beginning. And the problem actually gets worse. And then I mentioned, essentially, string theory is more or less unique. You have five different formulations of string theory. If you went to 11 or 12 dimensions, you get something that's called MRF theory. And this is essentially unique. So you have a unique theory in 11 or 12 dimensions. You have a few um, here in 10 dimensions. Now you choose your Calabiao manifold, and this is where the fun starts. So now you go down to um, four dimensions, and you can choose for each of these, you can choose different compactification manifolds. And then on each compactification manifold, you can choose different fluxes, brains, and so on. So this is how, this is where all the non uniqueness comes in. And in fact, we, we know the problem is bad, but we don't actually know how bad it actually is. So, <coughs> first of all, are there infinitely many Calabiao manifolds? We do not know. There's a mathematician, Reed, who fantasized that all Calabiao manifolds are connected. So you can, have, you can write down a graph where each Calabiao manifold is a node, and then you can perform mathematical transformations between them. And the conjecture of Reed is that this graph is connected. We do not know whether it's true. We know that it's true for two-dimensional and four-dimensional. Calabiao manifolds, we do not know whether it's true for six dimensional Calabiao manifolds. There are some partial results in this, uh, in this area, but it's not even a physicist proof, let alone a mathematics proof that this is finite. Then there's the second question Are there finitely or infinitely many choices for the brains and the fluxes? Again, we do not know what the answer is. And we have studied a few concrete examples. And in these, it turns out that there were finitely many choices. But we do not know whether this is always true. Irrespective of whether it's true or not, it has been argued that the number of possibilities is huge, and people float around this number of 10 to the 500 different choices for, um, for the string background. So that's one problem. We have this gigantic number of possible choices, and we do not know which one to select. However, depending on which one we select, we get our different physics. So we need to, the name of the game then becomes to find a background or these configurations, the compacti compactification space, the fluxes and the brains, such that, um, such that we get results that resemble things that we observe from experiments. Yes. Uh, when you say finite, it's before or after imposing constraints like uh, supersymmetry? This is after. Thank you for the question. This is after. Before, it's known that it's not finite. After you impose the constraints, um, there are constructs, there's also a construction of an infinite family, but this is finite at every energy so scale. So it's more like the number of consistent uh, 
Uh, yes, it's a number of consistent con compactifications at a fixed energy scale. Problem number two is a uh, computational complexity. So I just told you we have this. I told you two separate things. I told you we have 10 to the 500 solutions, and I told you that it's very stringent and it's very hard to find these solutions. This sounds like two competing facts, but actually both are true. So if you want to find a solution to these very stringent consistency conditions, you have to solve computationally very hard problems. So we are now tasked with something that can deal with a huge number of solutions and solution spaces and at the same time tackle problems that are computationally hard. And this is sort of why, why I think we should need to use machine learning. And in fact, the first papers on machine learning in string theory only appeared uh, 2017, June 2017. So in this regard, machine learning so sort of we we own it, it, we as string theorists only discovered machine learning very recently. I cannot tell you what the motivations of the others were, but my motivation was essentially trying to beat complexity and trying to beat uh, this huge number of possibilities. Despite the fact that it's very young, it's a very active field, and we have already had a lot of meetings. Maybe there were even more. So next time I can also put a slide of of this meeting. And um, yeah, so the, the community is growing and it's uh, more and more people are actively trying to, to understand physics from the machine learning perspective. So here are a few things that have been done so far. It's an incomplete list, but I just wanted to tell you the tools that people apply in my field. So what you see here is a picture of uh, solutions to string theory in a specific setup. And you see that you have this interesting structure. Here's every point is a solution and you see that you have some in interesting structure in here. Here's are also different types of solutions and the ones that are phenomenologically interesting are marked in red. Then um, supervised learning is a, is a large field where we try to bypass the computational complex problems. Um, so we use deep neural networks or support vector machines to uh, to get answers for problems that we cannot solve otherwise. People are also interested in uh, intelligible AI, so using white box models like uh, decision trees or equation learners in order to infer properties of the underlying model. And lastly, there's um, reinforcement learning, which solves a Markov decision problem, and this is what the last part of my talk will be about. Okay. Are there any questions concerning my introduction? Good. So we move on to computational complexity and decidability. Uh, who, is, who is familiar with complexity theory? OK, I'll, I'll try to give an in-between. <laughs> so definition a problem, f, is a map from instances to outputs. This is uh, how I want to define a problem. And then a decision problem is a problem where the answer is yes or no. Um, you can set up it this way. You can set up any problem. And then you can ask whether a Turing machine or any computer with a programming language that is in the same hierarchy as the Turing machine in terms of power of the language and the same Chomsky hierarchy can solve the problem. But usually, if you want to talk about complexity, it's uh, better to make uh, statements for decision problems rather than general problems. This sounds as if this is restricting, but often you can actually formulate a problem in terms of a decision problem if you add some extra data. So for example, if the problem is find a minimum of some scalar function, you can turn this into a decision problem, which asks, does there exist the next star such that f of x star is smaller than some size. Of course, they're not equivalent, but at least you would get a bound if you, if you formulate it like that. So this is, a, this is the definition of a decision problem. And now you can use this actually to make this and uh, what's called reduction, polynomial time reduction, to make statements about 
how hard several problems are to solve. So a polynomial time reduction from some problem f, to decision problem f, to some other decision problem g, is a polynomial, polynomial time algorithm which maps the instances i of f to the instances i prime of f star, such that f of x is yes if and only if g of f of x is also yes. So you can use this to map essentially one decision problem to another. And then you have um, you have these different complexity classes. Problems in class P means you can solve them or you can decide the decision problem. You can solve the decision problem in polynomial time. There are then these NP problems, which essentially ask you to verify if you are given a solution, you can verify it in polynomial time. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can come up with a solution in polynomial time. Of course, there is some overlap. If I can solve the problem in polynomial time, I can also check that the yes instances are verified. And then there are harder problems, for example, there are NP-hard or NP-complete problems, which means that NP-hard problems are as, at least as hard as, as any problem in NP, and NP-complete problems are NP-hard problems that are in NP. And then you have the same for, for the complement on the <coughs> side. So, as it turns out, if you have an NP-complete problem, this is as hard as any other problem in NP. So if you, this means in particular, if you could solve any NP-complete problem in polynomial time, this would mean that P equals NP, so these two circles would actually be the same. So I have drawn, the way I've drawn it here is under the assumption that all these complexity classes or all this hierarchy, this complexity hierarchy actually does not collapse and you have different, so P is not equal to NP and so on. So otherwise, if they were equal, part of this diagram would collapse into single nodes. But if you have a model which is not NP... Sorry? If you have a model which is not NP complete... Yes. All the classes of this kind of models are not complete. You said if you have one solution... Yes. Then all of them will have a solution. That's correct. So NP complete That's models are models... But if you, if you find... One which has no solution, this means that this class of model has no solution? So this means that every, so th this depends on, on, on what type of reduction. If I can find a polynomial time reduction to, uh, to this problem, then I can make a statement about everything that can be reduced in polynomial time to this problem. But the converse is not true. The converse, the converse is not true. Of what? Of your statement now. So if you don't find one, so if you find one which is not solvable, this means that all the class is not solvable? Yes. Yeah, if I can, okay. if I can polynomially right. reduce it, then I cannot solve it in the it's same complexity right. class. Yeah, and then you have higher, so this is, the, you have an entire polynomial hierarchy, and then you can go on. We have actually, very briefly, we have seen this on Monday in Florence talk. I have also added the class BQP here, this is, things that are solvable fast on a quantum computer. Um, again, we do not know the relation between all of this. I've drawn them under the assumption that DQP is not equal to NP. We do not know whether this is true. But if they are actually the same, this means that this overlap, that you don't have an overlap here. So if you could find any NP-complete problem that you can solve fast on a quantum computer, you could solve all problems in NP fast on a quantum computer. Conversely, this tells us that, so if this is true the way it's drawn here, this tells us that quantum computers won't help us, help us to solve NP-complete problems if this relationship of hierarchies is correct. So uh, some statements, well, trivially P is part of NP, as I said, and P is also part of co-NP. And this means, for example, so if P was equal to co-NP, then P would be equal to NP, and NP would be equal to co-NP, because P is closed on the complements, so this then would mean that all this part of the graph collapses. Then there's a theorem by Larden which says that if P is not equal to NP, there actually does exist a problem that is not in P and is also not NP complete. So in other words, if P is not equal to NP, you, this region here does exist. Something that is not NP, but is also not NP complete. So, Many people believe that these, actually, all these classes are different. We do not know the answer. If you knew the answer, you could get a million dollars. But assuming that they are different, so for example, we know that 
factor, factoring integers is in BQP. There's famously there's false algorithm which allows you to factor integers fast on a quantum computer. So if you believe this, then factoring integers is not NP complete. And also, as I said, a quantum computer won't help you actually solve NP complete problems in polynomial time. You need so these problems are just fundamentally hard, and even with uh, Google's quantum supremacy, you won't be able to solve the NP complete problems which we might have to solve in string theory. Also, this sounds pretty bad, but they are also even worse problems. They are undecidable. This means you cannot define or you cannot devise a universal Turing machine that answers a, that answers the, the decision problem for any for any instance. And of course, famously, the, this is the halting problem is one of the examples. You cannot write a Turing machine that decides whether an algorithm halts in finite time, stops after a finite number of steps on any given input. Okay, so why did I tell you all this? Well, remember this diagram? We understand this part. You want to understand the whole part. The 70% here are dark energy, and these dark, this dark energy is related to something that is called the cosmological constant. And um, the cosmological constant uh, suffers from something that is known as the fine tuning problem or a hierarchy problem. There are other problems as well. So, for example, why is the Higgs so much lighter than the gravity scale? If you want to ask problems like this, these um, already sound very similar to what is called the subset sum problem. This is an NP-complete problem, provably. And it asks, given a set of integers, does there exist a subset whose element sum to zero? Um, so you're given a bunch of integers that define your string vacuum, and you want to get very close to zero. For the cosmological constant, you get, need to get to 10 to the minus 120. So, OK, I said they're integers, but um, they're rational numbers. You can clear, of course, the denominators. Um, so everything I'm saying also stays true for countable unions of countable sets or countable powers of countable sets. These stay countable. There's the question, critical point. So if you have a, uh, if you have some scalar potential, a potential which depends on some variables or as physicists call them fields, phi, you ask, is phi a critical point of your potential? This is an NP-hard problem. You ask, is phi a local minimum of V, where phi is in some range of validity where your theory is defined. This is a co and hard problem. And then there are the Diophantine equations. So Diophantine equations are equations which you try to solve over the integer. So equations with integer coefficients which you're trying to solve over the integer domain. And if you ask the question, does a set of coupled nonlinear Diophantine equations have a solution? This is, in fact, undecidable. This was actually Hilbert's 10th problem was only proven not so long ago. And this is very relevant for string theory. All the string background we have is our integers. So we have the mathematical consistency conditions of string theory can often be phrased in terms of Diophantine equations. And if you want to solve the consistency conditions that string theory gives us, we need to solve these Diophantine equations. So it's bad news for us that in general these problems are undecidable. So I'm a bit confused. So for the critical point problem, you, you formulate it as a decision problem. You yes. say that it's phi a critical point. You'd basically check if v of phi is more than a certain value. But is that what you, how you usually check it if phi is a critical point? Typically, you take v, you derive it, you put it on phi, and you see if it's zero. I mean... Uh, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, so, so, but so, so, so solving this in, in, in general is... Um, I mean, as a decision problem, as you formulate it, I can yes. understand it's empty hard, but... You know, this question I can answer it in a different, you know, manner relatively simply, at least in my head. I mean, take v, derive it, apply it on phi, see if it's zero. No? Yeah, so what, sorry, so what I mean is, uh, is, it a, is it an x, so is it a local minimum or maximum? So then you need to worry about a Hessian or whether you're in a saddle point. Yes, but in principle, like that, that again, I mean, I, I can't believe that's MP. You know? So, no, that no. Mean, so th this checking that phi is a critical point can't be an MP hard problem. Yes. Identifying a critical point, uh, you know, maybe you get some equations that are difficult to solve. But checking if a given fight is a critical point, that can't be an empty hard problem for me. So the, this depends on this depends on the boundaries. I, I can explain this later. Okay. So and then there are problems like in cohomology. These are not even in NP. So 
the cohomology sort of is needed in order to find the, the spectrum of master states in string theory. And there is no, it's not in NP because there is no, no polynomial where you can even, so if somebody gave it a solution, you couldn't plug it into a polynomial and check that it actually is a solution. So we have all this collection of NP hard, core NP hard, NP complete, and undecidable problems or problems that are not in NP, and we need to solve all of this if you want to make statements or want to study things that string theory says about, about the real world. However, there's, there are some interesting properties in string theory. So one of them are called string dualities, and I believe Sven will say more about these. So what this means is there are mathematically distinct description of the theory that leads to the same physics. So this then begs the question, if you're given a physical problem, finding, finding something that resembles our universe, can I use this in order to uh, change the complexity class of the problem I have to solve? Or if I have a solution, can I sort of transition to other color VLs, so remember, believing that this graph is connected, can I traverse the graph of color VLs and um, still have a solution, or still have something which is decidable. So one example for the changing decidability is a symmetry in string theory that's called mirror symmetry. So if you have string theory on some color VL X, this can be dual to string theory, or to another string theory on another color VL manifold. So you have these are mathematically distinct objects. They, but they are related by this duality transformation, but they are distinct. So, uh, as it turns out, so if you want to solve non-perturbative physics, some effects that occur there on X, you have to solve a cubic Diophantine equation. This is in general undecidable. If you do this on Xtriddle, and Xtriddle has a specific property, then actually the cubic Diophantine equation you have to solve becomes a linear Diophantine equation on this other space, and linear Diophantine equations are in P by the triple L algorithm. So if you can do that, and if you can solve the problem here instead of here, you have turned an undecided problem into something you can solve in P. Also question of propagation of decidability in the graph of uh, connected Calviaus. So if you're given, let's assume you have found by some magic a solution to a Diophantine equation on X, can you perform mathematical operations, can you traverse this graph of Calviaus in order to find, uh, to keep sort of keep decidability of your problem. And in fact, we study under which conditions um, this actually happens uh, in this paper. Okay, so um, what, what we now have to do as string theorists, if you want to solve, if you want to study string theory, as I said, you put it, you choose a background geometry, a color VL. This you can do in linear time. If you go through the list of uh, color VLs, then or the list of known Calabias, as I said, we don't know whether it's finite or not. Then you fix the boundary conditions, the brains and the fluxes, and so on, such that uh, the theory is consistent. These are these. This is a coupled set of Diophantine equations, which is undecidable. And you want to have a small cosmological constant. This is an NP complete problem, at least if you solve it by a sub the subset sum. Then you need to minimize the scalar potential. This is NP hard and core NP hard. And then you need to find the master spectrum, which is this double exponential non-NP problem you need to solve. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a list of complicated things. So we now try to use machine learning to, to do this part, solve, solve the Diophantine equations. Are there any questions? Yes. Questions of the previous transparency. Uh, you say uh, you can map undecidable problems to problems in P? Yeah, this is because we are solving different problems. So this is, doesn't mean that P is equal to NP, or that doesn't mean that this undecidable problems are decidable. We are solving a different mathematical problem, but it happens to have the same observable low energy physics. This is the idea here. So the duality ideally is a function. What about the complexity of that function? Um, yeah, so the map from X to X triddle is in P, but I have a different, I also change the description of string theory, so I go from type 2A to type 2B string theory. I'm, 
I'm, I have a different theory on a different caveat with different boundary conditions, which happen to have the same physics. What does it mean, the same physics? It means that I cannot distinguish at uh, energies below the Planck scale um, what the predictions of these theories are. So th these, pr these, these theories will have the same predictions experimentally. <coughs> they, are di they are distinct on, on the level of how you define things here fundamentally on the world sheet, but they have the same observable physics. So is just the partition function the same or are all observables mapped on, on each other? Sorry? Is just the partition function the same or can you map the observables on the <coughs> You you can map you can map observables from, from one space to another. The, so this corresponds. Do, do you know the string theory? So this so mirror symmetry corresponds to different gazings on the world sheet. When the string when it moves through space traces out the world sheet and you can you have different ones there and you can, you have a choice of gauging these ones differently and this is what what mirror symmetry does for you. And so what are the, the undecidable equations mapped to? So in, in general, so yeah, you have to solve a cubic diophantine equation in order to compute uh, contributions from world sheet instanton uh, from world sheet instantons to your theory. In general, you need to solve a cubic diophantine equation in order to to compute these effects. If if you take the mirror dual and the resulting color VR happens to be elliptically fibered there's a divisor class in this color VR, which gives rise to a linear rather than a cubic diophantine equation, which is due to the extra vibration structure that is induced after you take the mirror dual. Does it mean that you can uh, find the solution of the cubic diophantine equation by this trick or not? No. No. No, no it's problem. a different problem. No. Like you, you yeah. do not uh, re relate the solutions of this. No, 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 no. It's, it's like somebody tells you, um, classify cats and dogs, and you say, I can't do it, but I can classify houses and cup boats. So somebody who wants to classify the cats and dogs won't be happy with it, but actually we have more mapped the problem onto classifying houses and boats. It just it's a different problem, but you can solve it, and the physics you can then sort of you can change the description of your theory, and the, the physics you get out is the same. <coughs> but you cannot solve you cannot solve the original problem. You're, you're fundamentally solving a fundamentally different problem. So for mathematicians, these are just completely different questions. It's just for physicists, they so happen to... Our physics is invariant uh, with respect so to the change yes. of this mathematics. Yes, that's, that's precisely the point. Okay. So, um, remember this slide? We will focus on one theory here. And actually, we will also focus on a very specific color VR. So we are just trying now to find good boundary conditions here, good fluxes. So we fix the string theory, fix the geometry, and we try to find boundary conditions here. Also, I will just focus on the particle physics. So I won't, um, I won't be asking questions about cosmological constant. I will only be talking about, um, about particle physics and the consistency conditions that string theory gives you. And we do this by reinforcement learning. So. I have a cartoon version and a ma mathematical version of this. I think I will only give you the cartoon version. So what you want to do is we want to explore the string landscape. So we have this energy landscape and we want to sort of um, traverse it and find a solution to uh, string, string theory's consistency conditions. So the way you do this is you take a worker or an agent and you drop it somewhere in the landscape. Oops, sorry. You drop it somewhere in the landscape and then these workers are conditioned to find solutions that resemble or that come close to the solutions you're interested in. So these are solutions which involve undecidable problems? Or? Sorry? Finding a solution, testing that the solution is a solution, does it involve uh, solving an undecidable problem? So, um, yes, yeah, so, so diophantine equations are... So, it, yeah, so you can, of course, if somebody gives you a solution to a diophantine equation, you can just plug it in and see whether it is a solution. And also, I mean, this was also a theme that was mentioned by Florent yesterday. The general problem is, is undecidable. But it might be that 
string theory doesn't give you the general problem. It might be that string theory sort of gives you diophantine equations which you actually can solve. It's just very hard to see given the diophantine equation whether or not you can solve it. So this worker will only solve solvable equations. I mean, decidable equations. So if the, I mean, if the worker finds a solution, obviously the diophantine equation has a solution, so you have decided this, the, uh, no, the question. Right. If it doesn't find a solution, you haven't answered anything. Right. So you just test solutions the worker. We want the worker to find solutions, yeah. As I mean, propose solutions and test them. This is what he does. So, the, 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 yeah, the worker, exactly. The worker finds, finds solutions to the consistency equation, to the consistency conditions, and then, of course, we can test whether the solutions it found actually solve, whether the proposed solutions actually solve the, solve the equations. So we condition these workers with like, psych, like behavioral psychology. They, they sit there and we, 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 we cannot tell them in supervised learning, we would tell them what to do. We don't know how to solve the equation, so we cannot tell them what to do. But we don't know what we want to have, so we can sort of incentivize them to do smart things that come close to solving the problem. So at any given point, uh, the worker is in a specific string configuration or in a specific state that is defined by the string boundary conditions, by the fluxes, the brains, and so on. So now the worker now subverses this, uh, this landscape by taking actions to reach new states. So this is how it, how it probes the solution space or the configuration space by just taking actions that take it from, from this uh, to that space. So at any point, it sort of has to decide which, which next action to take. And this it does by following a so-called policy. Um, and then, let's say it takes this action here. Then we check whether this uh, was a good action or a bad action and we reward it or punish it. So if, let's say, if you want to find a minimum, it went down here. So in this case, it would get a reward. If it went uphill, we would punish it. And uh, now we, we do this a couple of times, and it, so it goes down, it gets a reward, it goes up, it, we punish it, it goes almost straight, it gets a small dime, and then in the end, it goes down, it gets a big dime, and then it's done. This is, this is the idea of reinforcement learning. It's important here that we set it up such that it... Now, how does this sit with your undecidable equations? Because, you know, if I, if I don't find a solution, how do I know that I'm closer to a solution than I used to be? You don't. Okay. It so only works if it's fine. No, this only works if it finds a solution. Right. Otherwise, this doesn't help you. Right. Okay. So, it's important that we set it up such that it uh, finds a long-term, that it maximizes its long-term return. So, even though it climbs up the hill here, maybe it needs to climb up the hill to go into this deeper valley down there. So, it's set up to not just maximize its short-term, reward but it's long term return so it's okay to be punished here if it gets a big diamond in the end and in this in this way we solve a a mark of decision problem this is the mathematical formulation which i skip in the interest of time and um, there are different there are di different ways of um, or different implementations of reinforcement learning one of them was actually used by Go to be the world champion of Go in 2016. This is a slightly different one. This is called A3C, Asynchronous Advantage Actor Critic. So three A's and one C. And so asynchronous just means you have N workers so instead of dropping one and having it explore the environment, you throw a bunch of them in there. And um, they now ex explore it simultaneously. This has been shown to improve the stability of training and has been shown to improve the exploration of your configuration space. Advantage means you don't train it actually on the return, but you, um, you train it on the difference between uh, the prediction for how valuable it is to be in a state and the reward which it gets from, um, from going from the state to the next state. And actor critic is sort of just the interplay you have between, between two neural networks or two to agent, so we have an actor and a critic. In order to, to solve this problem, so in order to find this minimum, you have to, in order to, in order to do this here, you need to know essentially how good is it to be in a state and what is the next best action. So you need to solve a problem which is called a control problem and another problem which is, a, which is called a prediction problem. So the control problem is you want to find the optimal policy that allows you to choose the optimal next best action. The prediction problem is 
given a policy, can you predict how valuable it is to be in a state or how valuable it is to take an action? And this is done by this actor critic in this. So the cartoon we have is this. We have an environment, a string landscape. And um, we have now these N workers, which you drop in the environment, and they all interact with, um, with the environment. So they get their input, they sample their state, which they are in. We now use a neural network to solve the control problem. So we have a neural network that predicts the next action, and it predicts how valuable it is to be in a state. Each worker does this, and then they sort of report back to a global instance what they have learned. How do you decide that the minimum you find is a genuine one? How do I decide that? The quality of the minimum you have found. I will come to that. I will come to that. In a, so you need a reward function. You need to be able to tell the agent sort of you, what you did was good or bad. If you don't have this, you cannot, you cannot use reinforcement learning at all. Yeah, I understand. But how do you do it concretely? Yes. So how do we do it concretely? Thank you for the question. So we try to solve um, type 2a string theory on a Calabiao, which is given by four-dimensional space, and then we have these compact six dimensions, which are these here. So these are tori. This is a torus because you can identify this line with that line, so you wrap it into a cylinder, and then you identify this line with that line, so you wrap the cylinder into a torus. So this is how I draw a torus. We have a two torus, a two torus, and two torus, six dimensions. That is a six dimension compact manifold. It is a Calabiao manifold, but a it's a bit too trivial, so need, we need to do some extra things. I don't have time to explain. But essentially, now we can put a boundary condition on here for open strings to end on, six dimensional brain, brain, so they fill the three dimensions here, the three space dimensions here, and then they wrap a line on each of these torus. So if I have this torus, I can then wrap it like this, or I can wrap it like that, or I can wrap it in both directions. So this would just wrap it like this. This cycle here would wrap the torus like that, and this one would sort of wrap it like this, it runs around each of the cycles of the torus. Now I can put n different, um, n different step brains on top of each other, and um, I can characterize the windings around the A and the B cycles, the two cycles of the torus, by these numbers n and n. So if I have the seven tuple telling me how many brains I have and how I am wrapping the torus, or the, the six cycles of the, t of the six dimensional torus, then I have um, specified the boundary condition of my, of my brain and with it, uh, of my string theory in this case. So now the name of the game becomes to find solutions such that I find, um, such that I find the spectrum that my particle theory friends tell me to find and such that it's consistent. And um, so for the consistency conditions, they look something like that. The details are not important at all. What is important is that they are all to be solved over integers and that they are formulated in terms of these n's and n's. So they are formulated in terms of how many brains I have and the windings are all these six numbers. I can formulate all these equations and they are all just given in terms of these, in, this, in terms of the seven tuple of states. So this is, this is my input data. And now I need to find these n's and these capital n's and small n's and small m's such that these equations are solved. So presumably this is very sensitive to the fact that you put the MSSM there. Um, you can complete the standard model with MSS MSSM or you can put another uh, supersymmetric extension. So the yeah, so the equations don't... Um, so these are just the consistency conditions here. I have not imposed anything about particle physics yet. And I will only focus on, on, on this part now right. for, for, timing, for timing reasons. So these are the neural networks we use. We need a neural network that decides the next action and we need a neural network to decide how valuable it is to be in a state. These are pretty standard, feed forward, redo activation, you use and weight, weight decay, not, nothing too fancy, you see it's, it's not even rather deep. We did some hyperparameter searches, but it doesn't crucially depend on the neural network architecture we use here. So let's see how it solves these uh, Diophantine equations. Let's start with this one. So can I find n's, small n's and m's and capital N's to get 8448. Um, this is the number of steps the agents take, and this is the reward it gets. In the beginning, it's acting like a random walker, and we punish it for every, for every move it does. So in the beginning, it gets a negative reward. It's just walking around. It doesn't do anything clever or informed. It's not solving this, and it gets a negative reward. But then after a few, like after 2 million steps or so, 
it starts to find solutions. So this is the reward it gets for solving this equation exactly. And then you see it stays up here. So it has found a way of solving, solving this equation. Of course, it could have just tried randomly and maybe found a solution. But this thing actually performs much better than a random walker. So you can, first of all, you can see this is the number of steps it takes after it either reset or finds the solutions. So after 10 to the 4 steps, we re reset it. So in the beginning, it's walking 10 to the 4 steps. It doesn't find a solution. But then the number of steps to so until this reset goes down, until it finds a solution at around 100 steps here. So around here it starts solving. First it needs a couple of thousand steps, and then in the end it needs 100 steps to solve this. And we also see that the average entropy stays the same, so it's actually finding different solutions. Which so is you only reward it if he finds a solution? Sorry? So you only reward it if he finds a solution? No, we, so we, yeah, that's right. We punish it, we punish it for everything it does, and when it finds it, uh, so we, the, the punishment is proportional to the discrepancy with respect to 8448. So it finds its assignment of these n's and m's, we check how far is it from 8448, we sum yeah, but, up. But is it obvious that if you are uh, close to 8448, it means that you will find a solution close by? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. it's, so it's, it's a question of, how, of, of what type of actions we implement, but the way it's implemented, it actually is beneficial for it to, to perceive this and to, 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 to find yeah, So you only the solution might be far if you if it's almost 8448, it will be considered as a good even if actually the true solution might be far from this. Yeah, so if, if it cannot do anything close by to get actually to 8448, yeah. No. But it's punished, so it's always punished, it's just punished less. Good. So this was one of the consistency conditions, now we have all three of them, and we see a similar picture, so this is again 2 times 10 to the 6, it learns to solve this equation, then shortly after that it learns to solve on top of that this equation, and then after, I don't know, half of, 5 times 10 to the 6, it learns to solve all three equations simultaneously. Um, and it does so much more efficient than a random walker can do. So we, we check this against just something which randomly chooses n's and m's, and this performs less, less well by one or two orders of magnitude. Um, last thing I want to point out, so we did it in this way because checking, checking this is actually more expensive computationally than checking these two equations. So we check these ones first, and if these are not satisfied, we reset it and let it try again. This is not what people did in the past. So in the past, before people used machine learning, they did something else. So instead of solving 1, 2, 3, they solved 2, 3, 1. We didn't want to do this because, as I said, this is expensive, so we want to check it in the end. The reason why people did this in that way back in the days is that if you stare at this long enough, very clever people found out that you can partially decouple the set of coupled Diophantine equations. In the sense that if I have found by brute force a solution to these two equations, I can solve this one without destroying a solution to that one. It's like, so it's like a Rubik's Cube. If you, have to solve two, if you have to solve two phases, you can then do these permutation moves, which sort of change the corners or the, the edges to be a solution without destroying the, the thing you have, have done before, if you do it in a clever enough way. And these people have figured out a clever way of doing it. And so they have, um, so this depends on how many n's and m's are zero, and depending on how many n's and m's are zero, they have called this a-brains, b-brains, and c-brains. And they found that if you add the c-brain types here, you can solve the entire set without destroying what you have done here. So again, we see that String theory does not give you the most general set of four decoupled Diophantine equations, but you get a very specific subset that String theory wanted to solve, and this has this nice decoupling property in this case. So um, we asked them the agent instead of doing it in this way to do it in that way, and it also finds solution. And also we studied whether it actually learns this human-derived strategy of solving it. So does it does it find to use C brains? And indeed it does. So in the beginning. It doesn't use too many C brains because, well, so it uses them proportional to, to how many. There are also 20% of the brains you can write down as C brains, 30% are uh, B brains, and 50% are A brains. But then, sort of, it, it starts using mainly C brains in the end when it solves this. It, it has learned to, that C brains are valuable to solve here this equation once it has found a solution to these two. So it is learning a human derived strategy. However, it also solved this case. And in this case, there does not exist a known strategy how to decouple the Susie condition if you have solved these two before. So there is a new strategy, which is 
unknown to humans or has not been discovered by humans so far to solve them in this order as well. And in fact, it turns out that it's more efficient in solving it in this order than it is in solving it in the order that, that, that humans did it before. Not just in terms of computation time, but also in terms of actual finding, finding solutions. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so let me conclude. Finding viable vacua in string theory requires solving nested, hard, and undecidable problems. And we can actually do this, despite the fact that it's NP-hard or even undecidable, by using neural networks that make approximations or find some structure in your equations, like, a, like the agent did here. Find some structure in the vacuum and then exploit this in order to come up with a solution strategy. Um, for the last example I presented, toroidal orientifolds, folds, we found that um, the machine learning algorithm, the reinforcement learning, actually devises a strategy to solve these string consistency constraints. And we found that it rediscovers a human-derived strategy to do it, but it also finds a new one which is actually more efficient. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. So, question. Staying with this here. <coughs> so, the toroidal oriented fold, oriented fold uh, do not go with the um, undecidable problem. Sorry? It is it's not an undecidable problem. No, in this case, it, so for this specific case, we found solution, so it cannot okay. be. Now, uh, but this uh, uh, oriented fold. Uh, can be by choosing different parameters or boundary conditions mm -hmm. uh, can uh, go to the other class. So this is this is an extremely special case here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, this thing is is what's called it's itself dual. So if I mapped it to its mirror dual, yeah. it's again a toroidal oriented default so for this very special case now. Because otherwise, it seems that it's a contradiction. You said before, finding minima of a potential, and this is also a certain like that, is undecidable. Yes. Uh, uh, but no, it's, it's NP hard. Yeah, it's NP yeah. hard. Uh, and this is not NP hard. So. Um, well, I do not know a general solution mechanism for this coupled set of time fenting equations. So it could have been undecidable. Ah. It just happened to be not undecidable because I can find solutions to that. After you have done this, actually, you, then you need to minimize the potential. I haven't even given the potential yet. The potential is the next step, and this has to do with whether you actually want the MSSM, and then you need to turn on extra fluxes. So this were only the brains. You need to turn on fluxes. You need to uh, stabilize certain moduli you have in your theory. There's a whole thing, a whole list that comes after that. So this was really just solving the string consistency conditions. There's no physics in there yet whatsoever. And we have not minimized, uh, we, we haven't really minimized some potential yet. So it makes no sense to ask about stability of the solutions and so on. This yeah. is a question of when you have a potential, then you can ask stability. Yeah, so this is really just solving. Yeah, okay. So if before you have this, you cannot even do physics. So if you don't solve this, you have anomalies. If you don't use this, you're outside the approximation you did. And if you don't solve that, again, you have an anomaly. So you cannot even write down an S matrix, so you couldn't even Define. You couldn't even start doing computations in the first place. The first so this is this is sort of the, the starting point from which you can then actually even compute the potential in the first place. Okay. Does this tell you anything about the 10 to the 500? I mean, this number of vacua. There is a kind of controversy. Is it 10 to the 500? It is 10 to 100. It is 10 to the 50. Yeah. So so, so estimates actually. I have never had 10 to the 50. I've had 10 to the 500 to 10 to the 200,000. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah okay. Yeah okay. okay good. Opti so, optimist people. The, the yeah. Opponent. Yeah, okay. Um, so we have taken also this example because there was a lot of statistics. People had tried to solve it before using, not using machine learning, but using brute force. Um, and this particular case was actually proven to have a finite amount of solutions. As I said in the beginning, we don't know in general whether the number of solutions is finite. So this 10 to the 500 might actually be 10 to the infinite. This particular case was proven to be finite, but the proof is not constructive. They, they do not tell you how many solutions they are. They just tell you it's a finite class. And we find, of course, we find many different, we find hundreds of thousands of solutions, but 
you never know that you got all of them with this method, of course. We just know that it, maybe if you had, had, to, had run it long enough, it might have find, found all or it might not. We just know that it would terminate in principle if it could find all, because it did satisfy that in this case. So I guess in relation to this question, in your policy, in your policy you need to uh, implement in a way some, some uh, reward for the agent finding new solutions in the, instead of coming back to the same solutions every time. Yes. Uh, and, and then yeah. the, the finding repeated solutions would, uh, would mean that it's running out of new, new things to find. So yeah. This is an, an analysis of this sort? This is, yeah, we did. This is a very, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. So in general, when you do this, you have a problem that is called the exploration versus exploitation problem. When do you stop exploring and use what you have found? So when do you actually use the knowledge you have gained without, rather than trying something new? And the way we sort of do this is we have a... When we train the policy network, we, it is trained to maximize, um, to maximize the return and entropy at the same time. And then we have a switch which sort of where it crosses over and sort of pays more attention to, to the entropy and more, more, more attention to, the, uh, to what has learned and less, less, tries less to maximize the entropy. So in the beginning, it, uh, it doesn't trust the prediction of the network because it's untrained anyway. So if it says, yeah, you should absolutely know the action number 17, it's probably worthless because it, doesn't, it hasn't understood the, the configuration space yet. So then it's still paying more attention to maximize the entropy, but then in the end, sort of, you want to make use of what it has actually figured out. So if you're in this configuration, actually adding an extra brain to brain stack number seven works, or flipping, flipping the winding number in the third torus works. And then sort of, um, if it then makes a prediction like this, you want to do this most of the time, but still at some point, you don't want to act greedily the whole time and just choose the best action, but we want to choose the best action, which we draw actually. So we have a softmax layer here, we get an output that gives us sort of the, the best actions, and then we use it, we, we sample with, with the prior of the log likelihood here. We sample it from action space. In this way, we guarantee that we use the best action often, but not, not uh, exclusively. Can you use your entropy estimation to produce an estimation of how much of the space have you explored? Um, this is also a very interesting question. We, we haven't tried that. What we tried instead is, as I said, this has been studied by brute force before. So we were matching onto the statistics that people had pr produced. They had run this actually for a year. They had tried to brute force these equations. In, uh, so Ralph Blumhagen and this group did this in Munich. I should have put the citation. I apologize, I didn't. Um, our agent ran for 24 hours. But we find the same statistics. So it, it finds the same fraction of states that have that solve this equation or these two or have a certain defined set of properties that they publish in their paper. So in this sense, we know that it, that it explores the same configuration space as is explored by the brute force algorithm. Thanks. Uh, maybe I have a question before the next talk. Um, so at the moment you are, um, so at the moment, uh, you are um, putting into your control function solving basically, uh, the goal is to solve these constraints. Yes. So now you're on this way, that's what you're saying, uh, to introduce also particle content. So what, or how would you do about this? Yes, yeah, so for, for, for the particle content you can also, um, so you know we need, um, we know we need this. So again, you could count, you can compute the number of particles you get and you can find how much you deviate from what you have here. Or maybe you want extra particles in there to solve the dark matter, the 23% of my pie chart. So then you might want to allow for something else. So this is what we know from experiment has to be there. We know there has to be more things as well because we do not explain, we only explain 4.9%, so we need to, something else to explain the other stuff. So if the question is how restrictive do you want to be there, but sort of you could still reward on how, so do, do I find six, do I find four families of quarks rather than three, and then I would punish it by, by ones in some, in, in some unit, and then I could, I can do the same with the gauge groups, so do I find SO3 times SO2 times E1, if it doesn't even have that, then I don't even need to check whether I have quarks because I don't have a color in there, so then I would punish it again by the number of, we punish it by the number of, um, of missing gauge groups, and then we punish it by the number of, of missing or extra particles that, that are in the model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thank so you. We'll go to the next talk and we can thank Fabian again.